Thank you for letting me talk. Um, I am a professor of public health, and so the thing that I always like to present to my students and people I talk to is the public health model, which I think is important because it's often missing in the discussions of um, important environmental policy debates. Um, the difference between the public health model. Oh, sorry. And the medical model, and we often have students who are studying both medicine and public health, is that when you're dealing with medicine, the framework is you identify an indiv individual with a disease or malady and you try to treat it, either with medicine or surgery or some sort of, of um, personal application. In the public health model, we're trying to, now I have two clips. Yeah. Um, in the public health model, we're trying to identify patterns of diseases and to try to treat and create systems that will prevent it in whole populations. So one of the um, disadvantages of going third is you've seen some of these different types of maps, but I like to start off with what we know in terms of identifying the patterns in the disease. And this is just showing you the map of where the um, shale gas plays are next to EPA's map of radon. Now, we've already had a discussion of figs it's saying that there are different types of um, chemicals and radon in and of itself isn't the whole ball game. But the EPA map has been used to warn people for a couple um, decades now about radon in their home and where high radon areas are. And you'll immediately notice that the Marsalis shale is in a high radon area. And some of the areas where we traditionally haven't, um, have gotten our gas, the Gulf Coast, are not. Um, we know, again, you've seen some of these slides, that EPA has identified um, radon as a significant health risk. Um, one of the other things that you, hasn't been discussed yet is that although EPA has identified it as a risk, the World Health Organization has actually created lower recommended levels in terms of dealing with rem remediation should people find radiation in their homes or dwellings. Um, and uh, the EPA level is four pico um, curies uh, per liter, who has set that level at only 2.7. So there is some discrepancy um, in the uh, uh, scientific community as to what is or is not safe. Um, a number of people have said, you know, nothing is safe in the, um, uh, nothing is often a, a difficult area to remediate to. Um, so we have discrepancies in opinion, but we know that radon is a very, very real risk and that it causes lung cancer. We also know that there's multiple um, menu, venues of ways that radon gets into our environment. Um, the typical area that has been concerned mostly if you look at in terms of environmental auditing, environmental remediation, will be looking at soil around um, homes and other dwellings. So typically what's being looked upon is trying to seal different areas and make sure that any kind of radon that's being emitted from the ground won't get into different types of dwellings. But there's also concerns from building materials, potable water, um, ambient air, as well as we're talking about today, natural gas. And I say that because when you're looking at these things, you're looking at the total amount of radon in a particular environment. The indoor environment is contained. Different types of indoor environments have different types of ventilations that are going on. Modern buildings that are designed to be efficient often have less air exchange from the outdoors, which means that things that are brought indoor in the indoor environment tend to stay in the indoor environment for a larger period of time, which means that the, this form of indoor air pollution can become more significant. Now, potable water, I want to bring in a thing. Again, this is something that we're concerned about with radon is going into our lungs. Um, when people in high radon areas that have water that has radon in it shower, that also is a way that um, uh, radon can get into a things. Not as much an issue in New York City where we're drinking city water, but outside of the city where there are people will also be having um, gas, it is a concern where people on well water and other types of things. And of course, natural gas. Now one of the things about natural gas in the ambient air, a lot of talk has been talking about what is going to be in our, our stoves. And that, of course, is very, very important. 
But I also want to point out a study that was showing how much um, radon may be in the ambient air due to leakage in our current methane um, lines in um, Manhattan and around New York City. And this is showing um, leakage that was measured of um, gas in our pipelines. It's not really a surprise that methane gas leaks out into the ambient air in New York City. Um, some of these pipes in were put in in the 1800s. They're old, they leak. If there's added radon in the mix, and again, there is already some radon, but it has been shown um, that the radon that we have is a relatively low amount and so not necessarily a huge risk. But if you are elevating the level of radon in the ambient air, then that's going to mean that it's going to be coming in from the exterior as well as through natural gas in the home. Um, I already have had discussions about um, the fact that coming from uh, our current radon uh, levels in gas is relatively low, largely due to transit time um, uh, coming from this area and the half-life. Uh, we have right now very, very, very limited studies about the amount of radon that are coming out of the Marsalis shale gas. Now, you all know that in New York we have a moratorium. In Pennsylvania, the Marsalis, they're already drilling. And so figuring out how much radon is coming out of the wellheads is something that is knowable. Um, there have been a number of studies recently which have been hotly debated. Um, some of them have shown that the levels of Pika Curies um, are 150 to 160 um, at the wellhead and using certain types of math they projected that that could be up to 125 Pika Curies per liter in New York City gas. Again, EPA says four is safe. Um, who says it's 2.7? So we're talking about something that is um, a, a, a concern. Um, again, this is a knowable thing in terms of how much it is. The gas industry right now says that we don't know, but measuring how much um, radon is at the wellheads of these frac sites is something that is exceedingly knowable. It just needs to have access to do it. Now I'm going to take a minute and look at what New York's response is, and I don't usually like to read things, but this comes from a letter that was um, from uh, uh, the um, Department of Health to, um, from the question that was raised by the League of Women Voters in New York. And the question was, is this going to be safe? Totally reasonable question. And the answer was, quote, DEC and DOH do not believe that radon poses a significant risk to gas well drillers, other gas industry workers, or to residents in the vicinity of well drilling operations. In addition, and this is my emphasis added, based upon a review of natural gas produced in other areas of the country, and this is a footnote, that doesn't make any sense because a review in other areas of the country doesn't show the same radon level, so it's a kind of ridiculous assertion. But based upon a review of natural gas produced in other areas of the country, DEC and DOH do not believe that radon in Marsalis shale gas poses a significant risk to residents in homes that utilize gas. The next portion is what really gets me um, up in ire. It says, quote, however, if New York State permits gas development through HVHF, that's high volume um, hydraulic fracturing, in the Marsalis shale, random sampling of the natural gas will be required as part of initial drilling activities and DOH will assess these radon levels in an effort to verify that they do not pose an unanticipated health risk to end users of the gas. Okay, totally backwards, okay? If we wait to have that happen, then that means, of course, we already have the infrastructure in place. And we know what the argument will be at that point. The argument will be that we can't change it because the infrastructure is in place. We have the technology in order to assess what is available at the drill level, um, at, at, the, um, at the wellheads. It is measurable. It's something that needs to be taken into account before we embark along this thing. Um, again, I like to talk about the precautionary principle, which is one of the things that we're always telling my students. Um, that means that if we don't know that it is safe, we make sure it is before we do it. And that is a model that has been followed in Europe. A number of countries have banned this practice um, because of the precautionary principle already. We have that um, concept in American jurisprudence as well. 
Um, the FDA, for example, requires that if a manufacturer wants to introduce um, prescription drugs into the American public, they have to show it's safe before they start having it in commerce. Um, the same principles need to be here. So the main issue when we get into this is that we've had a lot of issues with what are the health and environmental effects of fracking and shale gas extraction. Um, we need to make sure that this component of it is safe as well. And we need to make sure that both New York State and the United States um, adhere to the precautionary principle because it's extremely important that we don't continue to allow people to privatize profits and publicize all the negative externalities that are available. Thank you, Professor. <laughs> Actually, I encourage you to get emotional. I think mm -hmm. the prospect of right on with your coffee is one I can certainly get very emotional about. 